If you've been following me on Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called now, you'll have noticed I have been watching every story in transmission order to celebrate the 60th anniversary. It's inspired me to rank all 26 seasons of classic Doctor Who from 1963 to 1989. All the seasons will be ranked here from worst to best. It goes without saying that the TV movie and Dimensions in Time won't be included here as they were one-off specials and not part of any official season. It should also be obvious that this is all opinion based. If you like or dislike any of these seasons listed here, that's fine. Just know that there's no season of Classic Who I outright dislike or think has zero redeeming qualities. Some seasons I just find to be weaker than others. Furthermore, I do take a few things into account whilst ranking these. I rate these seasons based on quality of stories, variety and the regular cast. With this in mind, hopefully I can justify each season's placing on this list. Without further ado, let's go. This is every classic Doctor Who season ranked. Number 26. Season 24. Yeah, this is my least favourite season. Season 24 is not as bad as I remember it being, it just feels like a struggle. This is because it was, as the production team had less than two months of pre-production and planning before the scripts went in front of the cameras. It is amazing we got this season at all, quite frankly. In terms of story quality, it's very 50-50 for me. The season begins terrible with Time and the Rani, that sadly does no favours to introduce the Seventh Doctor, and makes him way too much of an idiot combined with bland plot, dialogue and characters. This is such a vapid watch. The season does pick up a bit more with the middle two stories, Paradise Towers and Delta and the Bannerman. They're not great or anything spectacular, but they certainly show the potential this new era could reach. We then end on a bit of a whimper with Dragonfire, a story that doesn't really do much for me, despite often being ranked as the best of the season. I just find this to be a run-of-the-mill treasure hunt that isn't awful, it just doesn't do much for me. It certainly shows promise though with the introduction of Ace. While this season has perked up a little for me in terms of quality, I still find this the weakest classic Who season for just feeling like such a huge struggle. Number 25. Season 23. Yet another season that was plagued by behind the scenes issues. Go watch my cursed Doctor Who productions for more info. Season 23 was the return of the series after an 18 month hiatus and there's not much here that knocked it out of the park. The idea of putting the Doctor on trial is nice meta-commentary on the status of the series itself. And what's the most we get of this? Constant quipping, interruptions, and the constant mispronouncing of the Valiard's name. Yes, call him the Boatyard one more time, I'm sure it'll be hilarious the 78th time. The three stories presented as evidence are begging to get off the ground and truly be something great. But in Mysterious Planet, we're constantly going back and forth to the trial room for pointless interruptions. Though Mind Warp, in my opinion, is the only story that truly lived up to its potential. It's a fascinating analysis as to whether the Doctor's presence on other planets and times causes more damage than it does solve. Combined with the superb death of Perry, and you have a terrific story here. Which is then sadly undermined by the finale. Terror of the Vervoids is a pretty generic story with not much for me to say about it. And sadly, the ultimate foe ends on such a confused whimper. The idea of a future darker incarnation in the form of the Valiard is a wonderful idea, but not much is done with this. It feels like a twist for the sake of it. Season 23 promises big, but for the most part it just seems to give us story beats we've already seen before and done a lot better, such as the Matrix and the Doctor being put on trial by the Time Lords. It could have been a lot better written. There is greatness scattered here and there. Season 23 ranks as one of the lowest season, having such a been there done that feel. Number 24. Season 20. As an anniversary season, this feels so mediocre, despite every story having a recurring monster or villain in it, but that's not enough to save this season. However, let's start with the positives. Snake Dance, Enlightenment and the Five Doctors are all terrific stories. The latter in particular certainly made the season worth it all in the end, giving us a terrific celebration for all involved. Sadly, the season is played with mediocrity and outright amateur stories. Arc of Infinity and Terminus have the potential to be great, but are just hampered by mediocrity and the limitations of Doctor Who at the time, and just being quite dull. 
and the King's Demons may be one of the biggest wastes of time I've ever seen. You know the plot's not worth investing in when even the Doctor is commenting on how small time the Master's plan is. Given that the rubbish robot known as Chameleon barely appears until after he's written out, you have no reason to watch King's Demons. Mortion Undead is a breezy watch and nice to see the Brigadier again, but nothing too special. And that's my big problem with Season 20, nothing here is too special. There's only three standouts this year, I do admit, and whilst in other seasons this may rank this season a lot higher, the other bad stories just really drag it down. As an anniversary year, Season 20 was not the best way to celebrate such a momentous occasion. Number 23. Season 15. You may be surprised to see Season 15 this slow. I call this season a transition period, as we start with the gothic horror from the previous showrunner era Philip Hinchcliffe to the fantasy era of Graham Williams, and I do think it took a while for the stories to find their feet. Let's start positively though. Veteran writers like Robert Holmes and Terence Dix knock it out of the park with horror of Fang Rock and the Sunmakers that are just terrific scripts. Side note here, the fact that Terence had to write horror of Fang Rock at the 11th hour and still have it turn out be this good makes me question if he was even human. Then you've got your middling stories like Invisible Enemy and Image of the Fendal, which are perfectly fine, but they don't stand out too much for me. And sadly, the season just ends on such a huge whimper. Underworld is a dull as dishwater retelling of Jason and the Argonauts, and I personally think that the finale, The Invasion of Time, is the worst Fourth Doctor story, with laughable villains in the form of the Vardens. I don't know where the myth came from that Patrick Troughton fought tinfoil monsters, when people clearly forgot about this story. But with a story this meandering, long, dull, and padded, and lame, and pathetic, can you really blame them? Season 15 is a mixed bag to be sure, but its lows really pull it down, and I don't think the Graham Williams era wouldn't find its feet until the following season. For giving us the worst of the Tom Baker era, season 15 ranks pretty low for me. Number 22. Season 17. I was seriously debating whether or not to put season 17 or 15 lower than each other, but I decided to put season 17 slightly higher. Season 17 feels a lot more fun and consistent tone-wise. It is pretty much a wacky comedy, as we do have Douglas Adams as the head writer at the helm, of course. The stories range from good to nothing really that special. These include Destiny of the Daleks, Nightmare of Eden and Horns of Nymon. They're fine stories, but they're nothing too special. Creature from the Pit is the weak link, as it just feels tired and desperate. Now of course, the two standouts this season are City of Death and the now, finally, Complete Sharder. Douglas Adams really provided that year. City of Death is the crowning achievement of the Graham Williams era in my opinion. Everything about this story just works, and it's definitely one I would show to a newcomer. Combined with an inventive story about time travel and overseas filming in Paris, you have got one iconic story. The definitive version of Sharda included on the Season 17 Blu-ray is the best version we now have of this unfinished story, filling in the gaps with animation and editing it as a six-parter as it would have been broadcast. Both of these fulfil Douglas Adams' vision of how he saw Doctor Who, creative literature with an outrageous sense of humour without devolving into parody. Though there are times that Season 17 does feel like a parody, and it's not very good. Season 17 does have its ups and downs, it is a shaky year, but it's out with the dazzling chemistry of Tom Baker and Lala Ward, and if I'm in the mood for some wacky sci-fi, Season 17 is my port of call. Number 21. Season 3. I like to call Season 3 the year of the free showrunners. Verity Lambert was producer for the first two stories, John Wiles from The Myth Makers to The Ark, and Innes Lloyd for the rest of the season. The results are a pretty unpredictable season that produces mixed results. On a positive note, The Massacre, despite being completely missing from the archives, is my favourite Hartnell story. The Dalek's master plan is the epic to end all epics with 12 episodes of a journey across time and space with the Daleks at their most treacherous and devious. The Myth Makers and the Gunfighters are good historicals with a black comedy edge. A Mission to the Unknown is the very first Dr. Light episode. See Russell T Davis, you weren't the first to do it. The Savages is great commentary on the elitist government literally draining the life force of its citizens, and The War Machines is a good invasion story that didn't quite rival the Daleks, but came close. Sadly, this season has a lot of fluff to it, and quite middling stories in my opinion. Stories like Galaxy 4, The Ark, The Celestial Toymaker, they have ambition and surreal ideas, they're just hampered by cliched writing and execution. There is a lot to admire about season 3 however. 
I just feel the quality is hampered by the fact that so much of it is missing, making it hard to judge some of these stories. Companion-wise, they're coming and going so abruptly that it makes their exit seem really bizarre, Dodo in particular, and it is a shame Hartnell's ailing health was causing him to have so many breaks at this time, as I do feel the Doctor's lack of presence in some of these stories can hurt them. Season 3 is most certainly ambitious, you truly get the sense that Doctor Who can be anything. I only wish the execution was a lot better. Admirable attempt, but I'm going to have to rank Season 3 as the lowest of the 60s. Number 20. Season 9. Season 9 fits comfortably in the middle of the Pertwee era, with all of its familiar elements, and there's certainly variety to be found here, as we do have more off-world adventures with the Curse of Peladon and the Mutants, which is kind of ironic how they both parallel real-world events. Combined with three Earthbound stories that all feel distinct from each other, and you do have comfort Doctor Who here. But that is my problem. Everything does feel a bit too comfortable. Compared to the first eight seasons, season nine doesn't really introduce us to anything that new and feels like the first season to rely on elements from previous eras, such as the return of the Daleks and the Ice Warriors, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the season just blends into the background compared to others. There's nothing really here noteworthy that's a must-see. Furthermore, in terms of story quality, I do feel the weaker Pertwee stories were bundled together. The Mutants and the Time Monster rank as two of the Third Doctor's weaker stories, for just feeling lethargic and lacking any urgency. They have ambitions for tackling themes and subjects like segregation, racism and mythology. The results are either too long-winded or just lack any urgency in the dialogue or action, and feel like they're taking ideas from their previous seasons. With that said, there is a lot to admire about Season 9. John Pertwee and Katie Manning have dazzling chemistry, and some stories do pull off their ambitions, such as time paradoxes in Day of the Daleks, and making the Ice Warriors allies of the Doctor in Curse of Peladon. For having highs and lows, Season 9 ranks as the weakest Pertwee season, but it's still comforting. Number 19. Season 6. It's ironic how the most complete Troughton season is the one I consider the weakest. Season 6 is the definition of a mixed bag, with some depressing lows, but some incredible highs. The season gets off to an awful start with The Dominators, a sluggish pastiche on hippie movement that's so passive and boring, I'm just left wondering why the Doctor didn't just bugger off and leave all the people to it. The Space Pirates is another depressing low. We have episode 2. It exists. It's boring. We have the soundtrack. It exists. It's also boring. Maybe the visuals compensate for everything, but I don't know if anyone wants to waste their life animating this snooze fest. But, on a more positive note, we have some of Troughton's greatest stories here. The Invasion is a phenomenal introduction for Unit, and the return of Lethbridge Stewart, now Brigadier, and with this Earthbound format you can see why this worked for the 1970s. The War Games is an epic anti-war story that changed the canon, or broke it, forever, as we finally learn the Doctor is a Time Lord and his people are conveyed with the power of gods that the Doctor is rightly terrified of. The Mind Robber is a surreal experience into the land of fiction and was pulled off despite the production issues. The Seeds of Death is a brilliant rematch for the Ice Warriors, in a plot so good the Sontarans would nick it 40 years later. The Crotons... exists, but the Doctor, Jamie and Zoe work wonderfully together, and when they all say goodbye at the end, the waterworks open for me. Season 6 is a vital season for Doctor Who, and it's trying to be more than just a base under siege story every week, like its predecessor was, but when it hits, it can hit really high. But the misses are worse than slipping on a very icy patch and being decapitated. Number 18. Season 21. The best way to describe Season 21 is like having the most delicious sandwich filling, but it's between two mouldy and rotten pieces of bread. Let me explain. The season starts and ends with complete rubbish, but has great stories in between. Warriors of the Deep is a depressing season opener that is quite frankly embarrassing. You know it's bad when not even the cast look like they want to be here. The Twin Dilemma is a disappointing start for the Sixth Doctor as they made him way too abrasive and unlikable. It comes across as extremely misjudged combined with a plot so nonsensical even 60s Batman would be telling them to calm down. So it is a shame that season 21 starts and ends with crap, but everything in between is pretty good. The Awakening is a short but sweet atmospheric tale. Frontios is a gripping, dark story that gives all the regulars time to shine. Resurrection of the Daleks is a busy story, but it's never boring, and is a vital story for the Fifth Doctor. 
Planet of Fire does feel like a bland checklist story to get rid of regulars and recurring characters, but the location work is an attempt at something different. Of course, the crown jewel of the season is Caves of Androzani, that truly deserves its title as one of the best stories of all time, and gives such a perfect send-off for the Fifth Doctor, by plunging him into a war where his kindness has no place for him. It's only a shame the quality drops off so suddenly by the next story. Tone-wise, I adore the dark and bleak tone that Season 21 gives us, with death, destruction and bleakness surrounding all of the stories that push the Fifth Doctor to his edge. Season 21 has greatness in it for sure, just don't be put off by the beginning and end. Stick to the middle part. Number 17. Season 2. At the start of 1965, the big question hanging over the series was, can we do it again? Season 2 feels like a sequel in a lot of ways. Now that the audience is settled in, let's come back big. There's certainly a lot of ambition to be found in Season 2, Shrinking the regulars down to an inch, the Daleks invading Earth, a historical farce, a planet full of giant bugs, meeting Richard Lionheart, time paradoxes, a chase through time and space, and even meeting a member of the Doctor's race. Season 2 is pulling all the punches, but I think similar to its predecessor, I think the sci-fi stories don't hit the landing as well. The web planet is a lethargic slog despite being the only story to have a completely alien looking cast. The Space Museum starts strong, but then devolves into a dull Rebels vs Dictators runaround. And I know the chase is supposed to be a comedy, but I just find it cheap and tired. With the negatives out of the way, there's a lot to love about Season 2. The Romans and the Crusade are wonderful historicals, the Time Meddler is a bold mixture of sci-fi and history, with the Meddling Monk being a wonderful creation. The Daleks' Invasion of Earth is an iconic story that is a prime example of Doctor Who becoming event TV. While it is a mixed bag, Season 2 has moments of magic, particularly with the TARDIS crew and Hartnell clearly loving every second of being every child's hero at the time. Like any sequel, Season 2 has a lot of ambition, and certainly deserves an A for it. Number 16. Season 18. He wants a season that combines all the elements of Doctor Who, look no further than Season 18, as Doctor Who reaches its adulthood. The season does start off pretty shakily, with the Leisure Hive and Megloss feeling like cheap and tired holdovers from the previous era, but the season really gets going with the E-Space Trilogy, a series of stories set in an alternate universe. Full Circle has great looking monsters, lush location work, and neat commentary on biology and evolution. State of Decay is a wonderful vampire story, harking back to the days of gothic horror, and the way Warrior's Gate visually tells its story is nothing short of breathtaking. The Master is reintroduced fantastically in the final two stories, with the Doctor saving the universe from decay and destruction in one last hope. Season 18 certainly has a lot of variety, and I think it was a great way to end the fourth Doctor's tenure. When it comes to the regular cast, we say goodbye to Romana too, and the TARDIS becomes way more overcrowded than it needs to be. Some say Tom Baker looks like he couldn't be bothered this season, but I disagree. This is a fourth Doctor who has aged and become more melancholy, and I think tone-wise, his performance does match the rest of the season. Season 18 is all about entropy and decay. Characters in the E-Space universe are trying to escape to find a new life. The Master gains a new body and kills the fourth Doctor. It's all great storytelling. Season 18 was the end, but the moment had been prepared for, even if it started shaky. Number 15. Season 11. A very different Pertwee season compared to others, as the familiar elements are on their way out. The Master and Joe Grant are gone, the unit regulars are breaking up, which all culminates in the third Doctor bowing out after five years. In terms of story quality, there are highlights to be found here. The Time Warrior being the best story, a terrific pseudo-historical that introduces the Sontarans and Sarah Jane Smith flawlessly, Invasion of the Dinosaurs and Planet of the Spiders are both similar in terms of their merits and flaws, they both have a lot to say about the environment, utopian societies and redemption, but are let down by poor special effects. But I still love these stories a lot. Death to the Daleks and the Monster of Peladon are pretty middling stories that do rank low on my list of third Doctor adventures, but they're not bad, just perfectly okay. Season 11 may not have the familiarities of the previous third Doctor seasons, but it's really good with some overlooked stories to be found here. Sarah Jane is a terrific companion and there's a lot to like in this season. It was the end for the third Doctor, and a good way for him to bow out. Number 14. Season 16. Definitely the most underrated season in my opinion. It doesn't reach the highs of the early fourth Doctor era, but it is able to stand on its own to create something unique. And that's the best way to describe season 16. 
unique. It's the only season to feature Mary Tam as Romana. Fully enough, it's also the last season until series 11 of the revived series to have no recurring monsters or villains, and one of those few classic Who seasons to have an ongoing arc. The entire season is about the Doctor assembling the key to time, with six segments scattered across the universe. You'd think the stories would be limited by this arc, but I don't think they are. The serials are all very well distinct from each other. Planet selling con men, a cyborg pirate, blood sucking stones, a swashbuckling thriller, a giant squid and an interplanetary war for the finale. Season 16 certainly doesn't lack imagination. The Grey and Williams era truly feels settled and focused here, with the first four stories are all great with true wit and imagination. The last two stories don't quite hit the landing. After working on and off for a decade on the series, the power of Kroll shows that Robert Holmes is tired, and while I don't think the Armageddon factor is the snooze fest everyone claims it to be, the budget really lets it down, and it's clear money should have been saved to make the finale much more epic. Season 16 showed what the Grey and Williams era could have been capable of, an epic fantasy quest that certainly isn't holding back on imagination, even if the budget isn't always there. Number 13. Season 8. If Season 7 was the reboot of Doctor Who, this was the soft reboot. Let me explain. The tone became a lot more warmer in Season 8 compared to the bleakness of Season 7. Unit felt less like a military operation and more like a family. Joe Grant was a much more younger character the kids could identify with, and the cast grew bigger, almost like a soap opera. And of course, we have the introduction of The Master, played brilliantly by Roger Delgado, appearing in every story this season. In terms of serials, two of these come in my top five third Doctor stories, The Demons and the Mind of Evil, Black Magic, The Devil and the Master trying to cause World War 3, just take my money already. We even have surreal Earth invasion stories, with Terror of the Autons pushing the boundaries of what living plastic can be, and the cause of Axos analysing the dynamics of one single living organism invading the Earth. Whilst quality-wise, most of the stories are strong, what lets this season down, however, is variety. As much as I love Roger Delgado as the master, having him in appear in every story is too much. Serials like Claws of Axos and Colony in Space really have no purpose for him. In the former, he's not even the main villain, and the latter story just feels like he's only there to make a potentially interesting four-parter, a very middling six-parter. However, what keeps Season 8 strong is its cast. The Unit family are all wonderful to watch, and while Season 8 may be the most repetitive of seasons, its quality of episodes definitely shouldn't be ignored. Number 12. Season 19. The best word to describe Season 19 is fresh. After a seven-year-long tenure with Tom Baker as the Doctor, Peter Davison had big shoes to fill, and he certainly pulled it off with his youth and energy. In every story he's in, it feels like such a huge cry of energy that Doctor Who needed to take it into the 1980s, and story-wise, we have some strong ones that are all varied in tone and quality. Earthshock is the clear highlight, fe featuring the shock return of the Cybermen and the death of Adric. Kinder is a wonderfully psychological horror story. The Visitation and Black Orchid are comforting historicals, and Castro Valva is a great surreal start for the Fifth Doctor. Stories like Four to Doomsday and Time Flight do let the season down, and you know they're bad when not even the cast like any of these stories. But season 19 pulls everything off with energy and youth, all thanks to a terrific performance from our leading man. Season 19 had to prove that Doctor Who could survive without Tom Baker, and they definitely succeeded for the most part. And whilst it did start the trend of Doctor Who becoming more continuity heavy in the mid-1980s, the consistency of this season certainly pulls it off. Number 11. Season 22. Okay, this might be the most controversial placing on this list, but I can't help myself, this is my comfort season. I could put any of these stories from season 22 on, apart from Time Lash, and never not be in the mood for them. Attack of the Cybermen and Revelation of the Daleks are my two favourite stories of all time. Vengeance on Varos dis depicts a society continually choosing to live in misery, despite the corrupt government is depressed singly relevant even today. The Two Doctors is a witty return for my favourite Doctor and companion, and whilst Mark of the Rani doesn't have the strongest plot, the interplay between the Doctor, the Master and the Rani is certainly a highlight for the Six Doctors' only adventure in history. I am often the first to defend this season, but what I can't defend is Time Lash. Yeah, it is the weakest of the season and pretty cheap and rubbish, but not every story is gold in any season. You know this, every season has its, has its weak points. 
The strength of this season more than make up for the shortcomings, particularly with Colin Baker as the Sixth Doctor, who approached the role with more enthusiasm than any of his predecessors, and lights up the screen in any scene he's in. I even don't m mind his relationship with Perry this season. Half of the time it's good-natured sarcastic banter, but you can tell there's a care for one another, though sometimes, yeah, it can be pretty grating. As much as fandom is trying to tell me that this season is the beginning of the end for the series and it's the worst thing ever and an abomination known to man, season 22 is a brash, loud and colourful season that is certainly worthy of its place on this ranking. Number 10. Season 1. Of course the season that started it all had to make it to the top 10. Season 1 I find to be pure magic in a lot of ways. With the series being this imaginative and this creative, it's no wonder the series is still going strong today. An Unearthly Child's first episode is pure perfection, it introduces the cast and the premise of the series flawlessly, and that cliffhanger still gives me chills to this day. But of course, this season wouldn't be as remembered without the Daleks, as they're given a brilliant intro that perfectly show their xenophobic nature, combined with an iconic design and staccato voice, it's no wonder kids were imitating them in the playground. Season 1's other strengths lie in its historicals. Marco Polo and the Aztecs are both wonderful trips to the past that depict figures and society from the past to create excellent character dramas, and the Reign of Terror, whilst not reaching the same heights, does offer different perspectives on the French Revolution, and not just taking a side and sticking with it. Where Season 1 falls down is the other sci-fi stories. They aren't bad per se, just very average. The Edge of Destruction is a decent psychological horror story that works okay considering there was no budget, but stories like Keys of Marinus and the Sensorites aren't all that engaging, and I feel are just too long-winded for six episodes. Nevertheless, Season 1 has a wonderful set of stories that kickstarted Dot 2 off splendidly, and definitely deserves its place within the top 10. Number 9. Season 4. Season 4 is a crucial year within Doctor Who's history, with William Hartnell leaving the role after three years, Patrick Troughton had to prove he could carry on the series, and goodness me did he succeed. But season four isn't just about changing the Doctor, there's also other changes to the series, the pure historicals like the Smugglers and the Highlanders are now phased out in favour of sci-fi, the Daleks were given a final end and the Cybermen would be the next big baddie for the Doctor to face. Historicals like Smugglers and Highlanders are pretty fine for what they are, but the Tenth Planet and the Moon Base are stories that prove that the Cybermen were a strong enough villain that could rival the Daleks. Furthermore, we get two great Dalek stories this year. Rather than upping the scale like in previous Dalek stories, David Whittaker dials the action back and analyses what makes the Daleks tick, by daring to suggest what if they were benevolent or had humanity. Stories like Macro Terror and The Faceless Ones have been given a reappraisal from me, thanks to the superb animations, and even though the underwater menace is rubbish, so bad it's good type of story, the quality of the other serials and the sci-fi tone more than make up for it. Patrick Troughton oozes confidence, wit, energy, with a hint of a darker side, all of that combined proved that the production team could change the Doctor, and one of the reasons why it's still going strong today. Season 4 is a focused season, and while the confidence may not always be there, when it jumps high, it really sticks the landing. Season 4 proved that Doctor Who hadn't reached its final end yet. Number 8. Season 25. What a difference one year can make. Season 24 was made under rush circumstances, but Season 25 was made with more planning, time and a focused effort on making the Doctor far more than just another Time Lord. The season opera and finale are two of my favourite Seventh Doctor stories ever, with an explosive Dalek story that analyses their roots and embeds them in 60s London where white supremacy was on the rise, the greatest show in the galaxy is meta-commentary on the state of Doctor Who, on how it keeps going despite the higher-ups at the BBC having zero confidence in the show, and its audience being an easily angered vocal minority. The Happiness Patrol is smug, cheeky satire on Thatcher's government, Took me a while, but I do appreciate the Candyman, and while Silver Nemesis a, is a pretty average run around Windsor Park, its frantic pace means I don't get bored by this story. These stories combine with the wonderful relationship that the Seventh Doctor and Ace have, and you have a memorable anniversary season that may be creaky in some areas, but nevertheless the Seventh Doctor is truly finding his feet, and his era is only going to get better from here. Number 7. Season 10. This was certainly the biggest surprise for me, I didn't expect season 10 to be ranked so high, but looking back on it, this is a great season filled with colour, imagination, action, adventure and excitement. 
The Three Doctors celebrates the 10th anniversary with style, bringing the Three Doctors together with callbacks to the past whilst looking ahead to the future, by adding more Time Lord lore with the inclusion of Omega and lifting the Doctor's exile. Carnival of Monsters is a bright, witty runaround that's certainly an overlooked gem from Robert Holmes that may not have the notoriety of other stories of the season, but it certainly shouldn't be ignored. Frontier in Space has grown in appreciation for me, and whilst it is too long, I adore the Cold War feel with two mighty empires ready to annihilate each other, but no one wanting to make the first shot. Planet of the Daleks may be a remake of the first Dalek story, but it's filled with such colour and excitement that it's become one of my comfort stories that I'll always be in the mood for. We end with the Green Death, with excellent commentary on the dangers of corporate business and the damage they cause to the environment, and we get the ending to Joe Grant, who quite possibly has the saddest departure scene of any companion of the classic series. Season 10 is this production team on their A-game, making Doctor Who bright, political, colourful, and ending one of the most beloved companions on such a high. Season 10 certainly celebrated this anniversary with style, and you may be surprised at how well it holds up. Number 6. Season 12. Tom Baker's first season as the Doctor was certainly a strong one to start out with. Whilst we have familiar territory with the inclusion of Unit in Robot and old favourites returning like Daleks and Cybermen, Season 12 is already pushing boundaries. In this season we have two gold classics, The Ark in Space and Genesis of the Daleks, the former being a claustrophobic base under siege story with parasitic monsters that give me chills to this day. It's no wonder this story is RTD and Stephen Moffat's favourite story. However, this year's Dalek story is nothing short of astounding. Cliché to say, I know, but when we dial things back and go back to the Daleks' roots, it really reminds us why these pepper pots hold up as villains all these years later. Robot and the Sontaran experiment are good enough adventures in their own right, and whilst Revenge of the Cybermen ends the season on a whimper, the regulars this year are great. The Doctor, Sarah and Harry make a wonderful team, and I only find it a shame that this dynamic lasted only one season. Season 12 may be relying on old familiars, but the seeds are being planted that reassure us this new created team will be making their mark. Number 5. Season 5. Season 5 being this high may be a tad hypocritical for me, as I do rate these stories based on quality and variety, and most of these stories follow a restricted formula of monsters attacking a base. However, this is a formula I do really like, hence why it's so high. Six out of the seven stories are all fantastic in my opinion. Tomb of the Cybermen and the Web of Fear rank in my top five Troughton stories. The Abominable Snowman and the Ice Warriors have memorable introductions for these iconic villains. Fury from the Deep is a terrifying thriller that makes seaweed scary and gives us a touching farewell to Victoria. The Enemy of the World is definitely the story that's been reappraised most since the discovery of its missing episodes. It's a gripping, globe-hopping spy thriller that shows how terrific an actor Troughton is. All of these stories are marvellous, as this is such a comforting season. The elephant in the room, of course, is The Wheel in Space, a cheaply executed Cyberman story that I'm still scratching my head at what on earth their plan was. But if we ignore that story, Season 5 is all about Doctor Who finding a formula and sticking to it. Whether you like this story style is subjective, of course, but personally, I love it, and it easily deserves its place in my top 5. Number 4. Season 26. This is where classic Doctor Who came to an end, but my god did they knock it out of the park. Season 26 is so many things, bold, ambitious, emotional, complex, nostalgic, all combined with stories that discuss serious subject matter like change, evolution, survival and faith. Whilst Battlefield is your basic invasion story, it still holds up fairly well, but the next three stories are some of the most creative serials Doctor Who has ever put out. Ghostlight may baffle you on first viewing, but it certainly rewards multiple rewatchers with a powerful statement about evolution and change for mankind, and Ace being haunted by the mistakes of her past. Curse of Fenric carries on Ace's story that focuses on her present fears by exploring her relationship with her mum, combined with vampires and the Doctor playing chess with evil itself. Survival is the perfect icing on the cake, with Ace contemplating her future fears and what type of woman she'll become, with Anthony Ainley's greatest performance as the Master. Season 26 is holding nothing back and wastes no time in making Doctor Who creative and innovative again. It's only a shame their plans were cut completely short. Season 26 was a wonderful end for the classic series and I couldn't love it more. The crowning achievement of the 7th Doctor era. Number 3. Season 13. 
Season 13 is certainly no unlucky year for Doctor Who, with in my opinion 4 10 out of 10 grade A solid gold classics in this season. I'm of course referring to Terror of the Zygons, Pyramids of Mars, The Brain of Morbius and The Seeds of Doom. These four rank as some of my favourite stories of all time. Pyramids and Morbius are marvellous homages to classic horror movies with a sci-fi twist, with excellent villains that raise the stakes and prove the Doctor could truly be out of his elements with these monsters. Zygons and Seeds are earthbound adventures that feel like holdovers from the previous era, but racking up the horror aspect and giving us terrific monsters in the Zygons and the Crinoids make these stories gold. Planet of Evil may not be perfect story-wise, but we've never had an alien planet more beautifully realised in Doctor Who than this serial. The weak one is obviously the android invasion, as it's such a vanilla story that even I struggle to say anything about it in my review, but it's not bad. Season 13 is a gruesome year of horror for Doctor Who, and whilst it was making a certain easily angered watch group unhappy, it holds a special place for me within this ranking. Number 2. Season 7. Season 7 was the biggest change Doctor Who had gone through at the time. A new Doctor, a new companion, a new formula, and all transmitting in colour, you could be forgiven for mistaking this for another show that had broadcast six months ago. But Doctor Who successfully reinvented itself. Whilst every story is set on Earth, it more than makes up for this by the strong quality of stories on display. Three of these stories are in my top five third Doctor stories of all time. Spearhead from Space reinvents Doctor Who with confidence, ease, and a memorable new villain in the Autons. The Silurians already tries to shake up the inevitable repetitiveness of the Earthbound formula by making the underground reptiles the true inhabitants of Earth and humanity being the invaders. In an excellent morality tale that the Doctor tries to be the bridge between two wor worlds to avoid bloodshed. The Ambassadors of Death may be too long for seven parts, but it makes up for it by having corrupt politicians and humans be the villains as opposed to aliens. The season comes to a wonderful conclusion with Inferno, where the Doctor is plunged into a terrifying apocalyptic nightmare that easily makes it my favourite third Doctor story. Season 7 is a bleak cold season that is packing its punches with amazing stories, and whilst I don't think Doctor Who would have been as fun if it was a, as dark as season 7 all the time, I'm certainly thankful for this season for rebooting Doctor Who with flying colours. Number 1. Season 14. This is, without a doubt, my favourite classic Who season. Everything about this season just works for me. This is a creative cast and crew on their A-game that made Doctor Who the event TV it was in the mid-1970s. Every story here has great merit, and while they may not all be gold, there's not a single story here that I would skip on a rewatch. The Mask of Mandragora is a criminally underrated renaissance story with a dash of Shakespeare's Hamlet. The Hand of Fear is a gripping nuclear thriller with a beautiful departure for Sarah Jane. The Deadly Assassin is a unique story within the history of the show. The Doctor has no companion and is set entirely on Gallifrey with my favourite interpretation of the Time Lords, a petrifying rendition of the Master and the wonderfully surreal Matrix scenes. The Face of Evil questions whether the Doctor's actions have positive consequences, Robots of Death is a marvellous whodunit with memorable production design, and Talons of Wang Chiang is showrunner Philip Hinchcliffe's love letter to the series. You can tell for his last story he pulled all the punches to make this finale special. Every story is good or great and I just find very little to be at fault here. Season 14 is a leading man at the height of his acting powers and a creative team pushing the boundaries of how great and wonderful Doctor Who can be. That's why it's without a doubt my favourite classic Who season. And that's it, we made it through all 26 seasons. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite classic seasons are, let's see if you can rank them all from best to worst, all 26 of them like I did, and I shall see you all next time. Goodbye.